This video is a continuation of the video that I shared last week on the topic of presets in Adobe Lightroom. Now, if you watch that video, don't worry, I'm not going to rehash everything that I talked about last time, but rather this video is going to be more practical, more hands-on in Adobe Lightroom, where I'll be demonstrating for you the use of film emulation presets and profiles. I briefly talked about these in last week's video, but just to quickly summarize, a film emulation preset is a preset which takes digital raw data, the raw uh, photo that you capture with your digital camera, and then converts that information into a photograph that appears to have been shot using classic film stock in a film camera. These types of presets have been around for a number of years now, and they're popular with different types of people. You know, there are some that shoot both digital and uh, film, especially wedding photographers, and they want their digital photos to match their film images. There's also people who just want that aesthetic, like they want that kind of look because that's what they, you know, that's what they associate with classic photography uh, of the 20th century, and they want to get that kind of look in their portfolio of work. The presets and profiles I'll be demonstrating in this video are made by really nice images. And I'm singling them out and showcasing theirs because they're the ones that I own. They're the ones that I have used multiple times over the years. And I think their presets and profiles are well designed. You know, you always get good results out of them if you are looking for that film emulation look. So in full disclosure, uh, really nice images are not sponsoring this video. They, had, they didn't give me the presets. They're not paying for this video. All of this is just me sharing with you um, something that has worked well for me in the hope that if you're looking for film emulation as well, that perhaps this will be a good solution for you. I also want to take this opportunity to take a closer look at the difference between presets and profiles because profiles are relatively newer and we're starting to see more people create profiles in addition to presets. And it may not be entirely clear on the surface, which is better for you, which is better for you and your workflow. So we're going to take a closer look at that. And we're also going to just kind of, you know, take a tour of all the different film emulation options that are available. I'm gonna share with you some of my favorites. So I hope you stick around. <laughs> is Todd Domini. I'm a photographer, a designer, and I make videos like this one about photography here on YouTube. All right, without further ado, let's jump into Adobe Lightroom. All right, so here we are in the developed view of Adobe Lightroom Classic, and I want to take you over here to the left-hand column in the presets panel, where you will see I have a whole bunch of really nice images presets installed. Now, I have both version 4 and version 5 in here. Now, version 4 are technically presets, while version five are profiles. Now that may be a little confusing at first because um, profiles and presets are different, but the reason that version five shows up as presets over here is because these presets are actually shortcuts to the profiles. Let me demonstrate for you what that means. So if I just quickly come into uh, version four and just click on this first one here, you will see that the develop panel over here updates and this behaves just like a regular preset does, right? Okay, let me close that up and let me come back over here to RNI Films 5 black and white, select the same preset and now look at the develop panel. See what's happening? Nothing has been edited, nothing has been changed because this is actually not a preset. What it is, is a profile, which you can see up here in the dropdown. And you can also see by clicking on this little uh, grid uh, uh, interface icon over here, and then you can scroll through all the different options that are available. Which is better? Well, it kind of depends on you and your workflow and what it is you're hoping to achieve and get out of these presets and profiles. Let's get back into Lightroom and I'm going to demonstrate for you both version four and version five. All right, so here we are back in Lightroom. I have my original straight out of camera raw image here and we're going to apply a preset from the version four collection of film emulations from really nice images. And these are presets. Now I'm gonna come down here and select Kodak Portra 400. And right off the bat, I mean, look at that. I mean, you get these colors and the, the greens look a little more mint and um, and the highlights have a little more yellow and orange that have kind of been pushed into, into that region. And then the blues, I mean, the, the sky up here is now no longer um, that blue kind of color. It's now a little more cyan. It's kind of skewing a little more in that direction. Classic, classic Portra 400 look. Now, if we come over here to the develop panel, 
and scroll down and look at it, you will see that a whole bunch of settings have been changed here because these are all being applied by the preset. Take a look at the RGB curve here and you will see that there's a little bit of a lift happening in the in the blacks down here in the bottom, which gives it that, that classic film look. And I mean, it's it's more than a look, really. I mean, it's it's bringing the, the tone curve within the constraints of the dynamic range of the film, which has been shot because they don't really produce pure black or pure white, unlike digital. So you have to manipulate the tone curve this way in order to emulate um, that dynamic range, which is how you get this fade type of look. Then you have uh, the RGB curves and you can click through here and you can see some um, some edits which have been made there which affect color and then a bunch of changes in HSL as well. Now something I want to quickly demonstrate for you here. Let's just turn some things off. I'm going to turn off tone curve. So just by turning off tone curve in HSL you can see that I mean it's almost like my original default image except you know some changes have been made to saturation and exposure up here. But watch what happened. I mean, let me just turn the tone curve on and off. I mean, look at how much impact tone curve has just with manipulating the, the RGB curve here and by manipulating uh, the individual red, green, and blue channels. I mean, how much of an impact it has on the look of the image. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You might expect all these changes to be happening down here in HSL, but that's not true. Let me toggle on HSL and then toggle it back off again. See the difference? It's really subtle, really, really subtle. And you can see that down here in the saturation area. All of these are negative. You notice that? That's something that is just, I think, a really interesting thing about how these film emulations work because the way that the look is created is not additive. It's not about injecting more color and pushing more saturation into it. It's more a subtractive process. It's more like, reducing the saturation and pulling some of those colors back so that the colors you want to emphasize stand out more, which I think is just one of the really fascinating things about uh, color and photo processing, which you can learn by seeing the presets, which you can learn by going into these values here and seeing how they've been manipulated and how they work. Because just toggling HSL on and off you can see the difference and you can see how that color is achieved. So from a photo processing perspective, you can learn a lot by using a preset. So now let's take a look at the profile version of Kodak Portrait 400. This is in RNI Films version five. I'm gonna come down here and select it, Kodak Portrait 400. The thing to know here is, you know, with profiles, you, you don't have access to the settings, but the thing that you do have access to, which makes them unique, is this amount slider up here at the top. This is a lot like if you've ever done any color grading, any type of post work in, um, in uh, Premiere with like Lumetri and you are uh, stacking LUTs and you are adding LUTs and you, are in, and you are adjusting the intensity of that LUT, this is very similar because you can just dial this amount all the way down, pull it all the way down to zero and, and nothing has been applied. The profile does not exist. You are just looking at the raw image here. And then you can slide this to the right and slowly bring that Kodak Portra 400 look into the image. And this is one of the things that makes profiles so interesting because it's almost like a profile is establishing the rules for the image. It is establishing its language. Any edits you make are within the context of the profile. Unlike presets where everything is just kind of mashed together, right? I mean, you apply that preset, all the settings change, and then you go in and make changes within that. And you are, in a sense, by doing so, changing the recipe. You are altering the recipe that the that the rest that the uh, that the preset established for your image. Whereas with a profile, you attach a profile, and as I'll demonstrate for you here, the profile is basically saying, well. This is the white point for your image. It's going to be right around here. And then this is the black point for it down here. And now watch what happens when I increase the exposure of the image. See what's happening? It's kind of hitting this wall right here at the far right end of the histogram. And I can keep pushing this all the way up and it, it doesn't blow out, right? I mean, you can still see what's going on down here because the highlights have been protected because the profile has established this boundary when it comes to the uh, the white point of the image. I can go all the way in the other direction and it's exactly the same. It still does not go below that level. 
And that is because it's trying to emulate the dynamic range of of the film, the dynamic range of Kodak Portra 400, because it does not produce pure white and it does not produce pure black like digital does. Now, if we take a look inside of black and white, you will see that there are a number of classic uh, black and white film stocks in here. There is uh, Ilford Delta 100, 400, 800, 3200, Ilford FP4, HP5. And then there are the Kodaks. There's Kodak T-Max and Tri-X. Now, something to clarify with these numbers with 100, 400, 800. I mean, these are box speeds. These are the ISO speeds that uh, that you would use because back in the day, if, uh, if you never purchased film or used film before, you would purchase the, the ISO speed that you wanted. So if you're shooting in daylight, you would buy 100 speed film. If you're shooting in overcast conditions, you would buy something like 400. Or for low light, you would buy 800 and so on. And each one of these boxes, I mean, it's not like digital where 100, 400, 800 doesn't look all that different. I mean, it may be a little bit noisier between them, but from a color perspective and tonality in the digital world, it's pretty much the same. I mean, there's not that much of a difference between them. But in the film world, ISO is different. For example, Ilford Delta 100 is literally a different film than Ilford Delta 400, which is different than Ilford Delta 800. And by the way, I'm talking about the actual film. I'm not talking about the presets or, or anything digital here. The actual film. They have different chemical recipes. They produce different looks. I mean, they produce different colors, different tonality, different levels of saturation. Now, some of that variability that I just talked about is um, is evident with these alternate versions of each preset. Each preset that you will find in this pack comes with a baseline standard version. For example, like Ilford Delta 400 here. That represents what a photograph would look like had it been captured using a brand new box of film and just developed, um, you know, just using a standard process. It's kind of like the baseline uh, normal version, so to speak. And then there are alternate versions, which represent what would happen to the photo if had it been captured using, or rather developed, using different uh, darkroom techniques, or if you had scanned the film a particular way, or if you had overexposed or underexposed your camera when shooting. All right, that'll do it for black and white. Let's move on to the next one and take a look at the instant uh, film emulations here. And as expected, you have uh, film from Fuji and Polaroid. Of course, Polaroid being the inventor of um, instant photography, which by the way, uh, if you haven't seen it, I made a documentary short about the life and, and career of Edwin Land and his company Polaroid and the invention of instant photography. It's on my channel. I will link to it up here if you are interested in that and you would like to check it out. All right. So the instant film that you will find in here are some of the uh, Fuji FP uh, instant films. And some of these happen to work really well with this image, which by the way, was uh, captured on the coastline of Washington state. It was this wonderful beach community with all these old, um, you know, just very like modest mid century American homes. It wasn't like one of those resorty kind of places at all. And I happened to come across this a frame and I mean, the sun was starting to go down and I was hoping that I would get some good light. And, um, and I don't know, I have a thing for a frames. So that's the story behind the photo you're looking at here. Let's move on to Polaroid. And then, I mean, some of these will look like, <laughs> it's like, um, I don't know if you're my age, they will look like some of the, uh, some of your family photos from back in the sixties and the seventies. You have Polaroid 600, 669, 690, and then different versions within there, different uh, fades. Um, some there are more muted and some that replicate the look of uh, instant film that was captured if that film had been expired, which I find really fascinating. I mean, for example, this is 669 by itself, like a brand new box of film. This is what you could expect if you were capturing a photo with it. But then here's what it looks like if 669 were expired, right? I mean, you can see that it's quite different from uh, the regular version. I mean, the colors become more saturated, it gets more contrasty, and it just has a very different look to it. By the way, in case you didn't know, film is not like milk. I mean, when when it expires, don't throw it out. I mean, there is a whole market for that out there. You can put them on eBay and people absolutely will buy expired film because there are a number of people who prefer shooting with expired film in order to get that unique look. 
All right, so that should give you a pretty good understanding of instant. Let's move on to negative. Now negative, these are some of the most popular uh, film options out there, even today. I mean, some of these are still being man manufactured, like I have a box of Fuji Pro 400H, uh, medium format sitting right here on my desk. So obviously it's still made, still very much alive today. So some of these are represented in this collection, but then there are other ones. I mean, some really interesting ones like Agfa Optima, which is a very kind of color neutral film. I mean, it's, it's rather unbiased. It's just a good, um, you know, it doesn't exhibit a lot of the characteristics and strong personality of some of the other films that, that I have noticed. Let's keep moving down. And then we get into the Fuji's now, you know, Fuji obviously with, you know, as evidenced by the film I have here, I mean, are still some of the most popular ones today because they have that classic Fuji look, right? I mean, you, you probably know what I'm talking about. Like there's that kind of those mint greens and those, you know, kind of, you know, tinged those pink kind of magenta highlights. Something about Fuji, just something really, really interesting that I think either you 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 love or you, you don't particularly care for, but it definitely has a look, definitely has a particular personality to it, which I think works with some images and some it just, you know, doesn't quite gel as well. But I think with a photograph like this, it works really well. I think that one looks, yeah. Fuji Pro 160, uh, Aqua Fade and a Green Fade. I mean, some of these just really look nice with this particular type of a photo here. And if we keep going down the list, then we get into some of the most sought after looks around and some of the ones that like entire portfolios of work have been created with. You have Kodak Ektar uh, 100, very uh, vibrant film. And as you can see, it behaves quite differently depending on whether it's underexposed or, or overexposed in camera. Kodak Gold, which has very rich uh, warm highlights, a lot of yellow and orange and just really solid color. I think this was most likely a portrait um, type of film when, it, you know, back in the day when people were using it. I don't know because I've I've never shot anything with it. And then we get into the portraits. Now, I mean, portrait is almost a genre unto itself. It has a particular look that is probably one of the most popular film looks of all time and has been emulated and it, it's I mean, come on. And then we get into the heavy hitter known as Kodak Portra 400. Still very much used today. And again, as you can see here, you know, like Kodak Portra 400 by itself, you know, gives you a look that looks like this. The colors are somewhat neutral. Um, and, and, um, and you can definitely see that in the house and like the wood planks on the front of the house. And then if you go to the overexposed version, you can see that it changes, right? I mean, you get a little more red, a little more magenta in the highlights. And then Kodak Portra 800. Um, this one looks really nice uh, with this particular image, I think. Underexposed, overexposed. As you can see, if you overexpose Kodak Portra 800, you get more red, more red in the shadows, more red in the midtones and the highlights. And this is part of the reason why some people, when they, when they use film, they always overexpose. Like if this is the look that they're going for, they don't shoot it at, at you know, using the, the rated box speed. I mean, they always overexpose a little bit to get that, you know, specific look, which is, again, just fascinating about film. All right, let's move on to the next one. I apologize if this is taking a while, but I just happen to be kind of, I don't know, enthusiastic about film and, and talking about different film types. I'm just always fascinated by this topic. Um, all right, so in slide, you know, these are, uh, you know, positive films. They have richly saturated colors, very contrasty. And there are a number of different uh, slide films. Many of these are no longer produced. But there are uh, classics in here that you may recognize, including uh, Fuji Provia 100F, a cool version, a warm version, like you had attached different filters to your lens. Fuji Velvia 50 uh, you know, very fast film. This is also different alternates in here as well. Now let's move on to the next category. And those are the vintage ones. Now vintage is early 20th century film. And these are divided into two types. There is Agvacolor and there is Kodachrome. Agvacolor was like the, uh, like the German response to Kodak and Kodachrome back in the early 20th century, back in like the thirties and the forties and the, and the 1950s. And they are actually organized that way here in the collection. So you have uh, Agvacolor 40s, Agvacolor 50s, Agvacolor 60s. And, you know, this is entirely because 
the manufacturer was altering and changing the chemical compound, the chemical recipe of the film over time. So you have a uh, different film that is represented by different decades here. And Kodachrome is the same. Kodak kept, kept tweaking the formula of their film as well. So the 40s version of it looks different from the 50s version, looks different from the 60s version, and so on. But in general, I mean, one of the things that I just so love about film emulation is that, I mean, when you have a particular image, I mean, something like this A-frame image that we've been looking at here, when you have one that just seems to be begging to be uh, treated this way, begging to be processed in this way, because of it, it, it evokes a particular character and a particular mood and atmosphere that perhaps reminds you of like classic 20th century film photography. And, and it just seems to be asking for it and it wants that. And yeah, I mean, you can go in and actually edit the image yourself and, and process it that way to give it a film-like look. But the next best, next best thing, especially if you don't have years and years of experience uh, doing photo processing, is to use an, an, an emulation. And it, you also then get consistent results too from image to image to image as you are working. By the way, if you would like to check out the film emulation presets and profiles from really nice images and try them out with your images, I will leave a link below so that you can go and check those out. It looks like my uh, my accent light turned off for a second back there. Didn't know it, it could do that. Uh, listen, thanks so much for being here. I appreciate your time and attention. If you learned something from this video today, please remember to give it a thumbs up. It really does help get videos like mine out in front of more people and get more people exposed to the channel. Speaking of the channel, if you haven't done so already, uh, consider subscribing. If you are into this topic, if you are into photography, if you are into uh, filmmaking, if you are into uh, photo processing and just kind of everything about photo and video, that's what my channel is about here on YouTube. So please remember to hit the subscribe button below to keep in touch in the future. I hope wherever in the world you are, wherever you are watching this video, that you are doing well in this you know crazy world that we're living in right now. And um, I will see you next time. Don't even care if I'm wasting my time. Nobody's gonna hold me back now. Slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. I just gotta...